Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Bernika Banks, and I am a journalism major who is minoring in Black and Latino Studies here at Baruch College. This is my senior year, and I'm excited to be here today. So this semester, I have learned about two new books, one called Dubbed, the other one called Undrowned, which has helped me understand a different way of comprehending Black and Latinx peoples through poetry. I never knew there was so many striking similarities between humans and whales. Um, a quote that still stands out to me from the book Dove is this one. Dream until you breathe, not from your mouth, not from your nose, but through your hair and through your skin. Dream until you claim the ocean. I am very fortunate to be enrolled in this spring's Black and Latino Studies capstone course called Climate Justice is Racial Justice with Professor Shelley Eversley as our brilliant instructor. We would like to give a special thank you to the Black and Latino Studies Department, the English Department, and the Dean's Office for making all of this possible. Please help me welcome the self-proclaimed queer Black troublemaker and Black feminist love, how do I say this word again? Ev evangelist, I just learned a new word today. <laughs> Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums. Dr. Gums, we are so excited to have you here today. And um, everyone else, please, you are welcome to add your reflections in the chat, add your questions in the chat, the lessons that you might have heard um, in your listening, or the imaginations that you might have after you go beyond uh, words, and beyond the words that were Dr. Gums's words. And for those of you who don't know a lot about this um, topic, I am going to invite Christy Thomas, and she'll tell us a little bit about Undrown, Undrowned and begin our conversation. Here we go, Christy. Hi guys, I'm Christy Thomas. I'm a senior two at Baruch and um, I major in journalism as well and minor in BLS. And so um, this quote is from page nine in the introduction. Dr. Gum says, in other words, this is not a book in which I'm trying to garner sympathy for marine mammals because they are so much like us. Um, I feel like in this introduction, Dr. Gums was basically trying to set Undrowned apart from other marine biology books. Um, when we read about it in class, we talked about how much it challenged um, what we know and what we don't know. Um, throughout Undrowned, Dr. Gums draws parallels between BIPOC people and marine animals who have endured colonial violence and hunting as well. Um, Dr. Gum, do you wanna talk a little bit about how the vignettes you draw in the book are lessons for us, for the animals? Sure, sure, yeah, thank you so much. I, I love what, I love being here, first of all. I love that I get to be part of, of you all's capstone and your senior year and your study of climate change. And this is a huge honor. I've really been looking forward to it. So thank you so much for all the work that you've done that has led up to this day and everyone who has supported it. And so, yes, I, I would say this distinction that, that you're drawing, Christy, is really important to me because when I started, well, when I wanted to frame this book, because when I started writing these reflections, it was really more for, for myself and my in my own marine mammal apprenticeship, what I need to learn about breathing and the salt water within me and around me and navigating unbreathable circumstances in my full dignity of blubber. All of those things are things that I needed to learn for myself. And what I started to realize is that everywhere that I went to learn more about marine mammals, like when I went to read about marine mammals or even you know the guidebooks that you can use when you're trying, when you see a marine mammal and you're like, what, what kind of seal is that? Or you know, which, which whale or dolphin might that be? There is a, there's actually such a colonizing language in the text that I had access to and I was like, okay, I recognize this as somebody who um, is still surviving colonialism and racism and white supremacy and you know, all, all the things. 
And honestly, I, I found it to be very triggering. I was like, okay, I don't, I'm, I feel like I'm mad. I'm mad on behalf of the fitted seal. You know, like I, I, um, I had a lot of feelings and I wrote a lot before I wrote the aspects of this that became this book. And what I realized was happening was that there's a difference between identification and identification. So identification could be the colonial practice of saying, I can name everything that exists. I'm gonna name this seal, I'm gonna name this whale, I'm gonna categorize people, I'm gonna put everyone in boxes, I'm gonna exercise control as a relationship to the universe. Control as a primary relationship to the universe. And that's, that's how I see colonialism. Sylvia Winter, one of the theorists who is, um, who really is, is a founding presence in, in what has been called what has been called ethnic studies and, and been called under many other names. Sylvia Winter talks about this relationship to the universe of control and categorization as actually the way of thinking that made colonialism and enslavement and indigenous genocide imaginable, thinkable. And it becomes thinkable before it becomes possible to enact. So identification is really really ha still has all of those resonances of its role in reproducing the colonial violence that we are reproducing in, in what's dominant in our society right now. And then at the same time, I found myself identifying with the marine mammals that I'm ever around, the marine mammals that I read about when I was researching, and that identification with is not like, what exactly are you? <laughs> you know, like, how, what are you? You're separate from me, and I can understand you and what you are and, and what you might do and where you should be living and all, all of these different things. It was more actually a breakdown between, a breakdown of that division. And it was an experience of, oh, I wonder, I wonder about you. And now I'm wondering about myself and I am not able to, to cling on to a colonial idea that I'm separate from you. So when you say that this, the introduction kind of sets up what we can know and what we can't know, one of the things that I feel is so wonderful and I'm using that, that word very specifically is that there's so much that is un unknown and unknowable when it comes to life itself. But the existence of the ocean, the depth of the ocean, and the facility of marine mammals of evading humans in, in a huge way, has it brings that unknowability to me in a way that is, is wonderful, which means it, it makes me wonder. There's so many things I wonder about. And in my relationship with myself, in my relationship with you, I'm really interested in staying in that place of wonder. I don't wanna feel like I'm finished knowing who I am, who you are, who we could possibly be. I wanna to continue to wonder about that. Thank you so much for that question, Christy. And um, Sydney in the comments, I'm sorry. She, um, she said that there is so much power in, the, in naming this and that science is an institution that has such a colonial history of social and environmental control. Um, Dr. Gums, do you wanna talk a little bit about how using different language can like encourage us to find solutions and stuff for climate change and the environmental crisis that we're going through? Sure, I mean, I go back to Sylvia Winter so much, and you know, Bernika mentioned Dub, which is a whole book that I wrote inspired by Sylvia Winter. Um, but I'm thinking about when you say how we can use language. I do think that so Sylvia Winter talks about poetics. She talks about socio-poetics, like that we we create, reproduce, or create a different society and relationship based on how we describe it how we can imagine it. 
And so it matters. It matters what stories we tell. It matters how we relate to each other. What Sylvia Winter describes is that there's, we're constantly in this situation of defining our relationship to each other and our relationship to our environment. And the dominant way for that to happen or that that has been happening is colonialism and capitalism, right? That that's, that's the language of it. Our relationships are mediated by, by the violence, um, the violent language of colonialism as a language and as actual violence. And so there are so many of us, I think some, of, some folks who are, who are comrades in that with me are even here. I feel like I noticed um, some other poets who have decided to come here. So yay poets that are thinking about how we are in a process of, of wonder again, but of deciding how to relate to each other, how to try to describe the indescribable. I mean, you can't really ever finish describing the ocean or a marine mammal or a person, right? There's, there's this infinite possibility there that means that we're always making a choice about how we describe and how we tell the story. And Undrowned is just, you know, many, many examples, like hundreds of examples of what if, what if our, there was more surrender in the language of our encounters. I mean, if, as you read it, you notice that I'm, I always get to this, like, I love you place, right? And that's my question all the time. Like, where, where is that place? Where is that place where it's love? Ultimately, it's love that we're talking about. Ultimately, it's love that's being described. Sometimes it takes a while to get there, depending on where we start. But um, yeah, that, that is how I think that language language can have an impact. And I think that's why, you know, as Sydney is pointing out, when you read most scientific texts, they, they, they have the pressure to be written in a way that's supposedly objective and distanced, right? But what I know, and I say this in the introduction too, is that I just really don't feel that scientists are, I mean, I know scientists aren't objective because no one is objective, right? Everybody's in relationship. But I also think that marine biologists who, you know, some, I mean, some of these people go live in Antarctica just hoping that they'll see a Weddell seal. That is not objective, <laughs> that is commitment. That is a passionate decision, I think. And so, um, and yet when they write their reports about this, they have to kind of pretend like, you know, they, they just have smart things to say about the Weddell seal. They, they're not like obsessed and compelled <laughs> and in love with the idea of the Weddell seal. And I think they are. So what would that language look like if I just already was like, okay, love is a context. It's not something that I have to hide. What happens if that is what guides our conversation? And Undrowned is, is really just a, a bunch of examples of that. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Xavier Jones. I'm graduating in the fall, political science major, <laughs> BLS minor. Um, so I want to officially open it up for questions. Everybody, we have some questions in the chat and I'll start off by reading one of our classmates, Shabar. Um, he has a question for you, Dr. Gums. He says, oh, you um, he wants to know why or your inspiration behind this paragraph. So the quote is, oh, you rough mermaid. What are you teaching us about breath? Oh, massive vegetarian. What do we now that our listening is much smaller? I, I think you're more than the, than evidence of deadline of the world in the, in which skin is for sale at premium, at a premium. I think you are more than another testament of the stark implication of the European voyage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, offering that, Xavier. Thank you for that question, Shabar. So that comes from, I think what is like the first, the first marine mammal meditation in the listening section. And it's about an extinct marine mammal which unless, unless they somehow regenerate or unless they're somewhere in the ocean that we can't find them, if it is so good for them. But um, Mamalis gigas is the Latin name that, that was once used to classify this 
large marine mammal, kind of like a manatee, but like much, much, much bigger that um, is the first marine mammal known to have been hunted and killed to extinction by humans. And so it was part of this European voyaging to the so-called new world to, um, to hunt, to, um, to colonize. Ultimately, there was a market for fur in Europe that was spurred by this voyaging. And these voyages would happen. And along the way, the people on the boats would kill this marine mammal and that's what they would eat for the whole rest of their voyage. So only 27 years after they first noticed this marine mammal, it was extinct is, um, is the research that, I, that I've heard. So that's, that's the context and what the, um, the folks who are, who work with the fossils, the, the folks who think about like what, try to reconstruct what this animal's life would have been like, understand that it was a very quiet animal because of its physiology, but that it could hear really, really far. And I think about the listening of this particular mammal as part of what is lost because humans hunted it to extinction. And when I, in here where I talk about skin being for sale at a premium, I'm talking about, I'm talking about the fur trade because the fur trade and the economy of the fur trade is, is part of the conditions that led to this particular extinction. And I grieve for that. And the part, the, the paragraph that Shabar is quoting is the point at which I'm like, you know, I'm upset, I'm angry about it, I'm mad. I feel like it's really indicting. Like, what does it say about humans that like 27 years after you figure out an animal even exists, you've killed every single one on the planet? And what does that say? And for some fur coats, so like, you know, there's like even, there's even more death implicated in all of this. And then what, and this is, this is kind of speaking to what I was saying earlier, where, what is the possibility? Where is the love? How is it more than just the loss? And I do think that the existence of this mammal and the fact that we at least get to know that this is a form of life that existed that's related to us through our mammalianness is more than evidence for everything that is wrong with our society that we already know. It could be an invitation to more listening. It could be a reminder of what it might mean to slow down. It could be an opportunity for reverence. It could be so many, so many things. Um, and that's what I'm reaching for in that particular part of that, of that paragraph. Um, yeah. That, that was a great answer. <laughs> well, of course, it's going to be a great answer. But <laughs> so let me just go back to the let me look at some of these comments in between this last answer. Um, so love that openness and curiosity. Yay, poets. Hey, we love poets. <laughs> I read actually, I'll take this time real quick. I, re, I watched a video of you performing a poem, Dr. Gums of Heavy Swimmers. Great, great, great. Um, let me continue. Claire, <laughs> storytelling, imagination, and curiosity is so powerful. Very true. We, we use empirical data in our class, but we also use the storytelling as a big part of how we learn. Um, I was just going to ask how we bring that sort of language into the science. Okay, you answered their question. Perfect. <laughs> and um, let me go down to... Uh, what I heard, oh, this is an interesting comment. What I heard, sonar bath breathe, wave rhythm against her right limb left over, 2,000, 2,500 2, feet, tiny graceful liquid worlds, toughening love, never less home between skin states, temporalities mothering this time. I'm sure that that was put in the chat for like a further explanation. So I'll allow you to respond. 
Yeah, I think that that was, that was probably um, a reflection on the what Janelle heard in in the breathe song. So yeah, I can say a little bit more about that. Which I mean, first of all, it's just such a huge blessing for me to get to collaborate with Toshi Regan, who's one of my favorite musicians of all, and you could hear why. I mean, I was jamming like that. That was my experience of the listening session. Was I was like that do do do. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love it so much, and it's it's so wonderful to have a collaborator, and I'm so so happy to also call her a friend who just just hears it you know and and her relationship to sound is so it's so phenomenal and I'm, I'm in awe of it all of the time and the sound that you hear actually and you, you can kind of hear it and you hear it a little bit more at the end that sounds kind of like to me it sounds kind of like a spaceship is is actually how Weddell seals sound which is like amazing to me like when I talk about the wonder I'm like I wonder why this sounds like a spaceship or why, you know, the alien movies where they, where they were creating those sound effects, were they inspired by Weddell seals? You know, like what, like what, what is the, so I wonder, I wonder about that. And I just love that Janelle heard all of this love and mothering and homefulness and that, cause that really is what I learn from this moment where, and you can watch YouTube videos of this if, if you want, you don't have to go to Antarctica to necessarily um, tap into this further. You can see the baby Weddell seal and the mother pushing it in. And the, the baby is like two through, like, what is wrong with you? You just brought me here. Why are you trying to drown me? And, um, and then, then they learn, right? Like then they, they learn to swim after these like few days living on the ice they realize that they actually can be profoundly at home in the water or on the ice, which is, which is really important to the survival of Weddell seals, um, which are a really abundant seal. And that's also helped by the fact that there's not a lot of humans in Antarctica to um, hunt them or hurt them. But yeah, so, so yeah, there, there's this facility that, that um, 2,500 feet that they can dive so deep and they just make this small little breathing hole and they can find it. You know, like all, all of that is amazing to me. And it does make me think about how we could be, become profoundly at home in situations that at first are scary to us because they're requiring us to grow and to know other capacities we have within us that we haven't used yet. Okay. Um... Yeah. I just wanted to say that what you said about the Weddell seals and how they sound like spaceships and stuff, that made me think about how in class, we're always talking about how everything is interconnected, you know? So I feel like even though subconsciously we might not know that that's the sounds we're trying to channel, you know, that might be it. <laughs> um, <laughs> earlier, Samantha asked um, if you have found that because the lens you see and write about you know, marine marine animals, which is like scientific. She asked if, because you write differently and less traditionally, do you think that others within the scientific community have been more or less receptive to it? And- That's um, A great question. Mylene also asked um, if you think capitalism, capitalism played a part in the death of, you know, artists that died young, like Kurt Cobain and Jean-Michael Basquiat. Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with that. Um, wait, let me remember both questions. Okay, about Kurt Cobain and Basquiat and about scientific community. Okay. Um, so, both are in the chat. Yeah, okay. Vylene and Samantha's. Awesome. Okay, I'll start with Vylene. Um, and so Vylene is, is drawing this connection because in, in the meditation about Hydromamalis gigas, I say, oh, 27 years, right? So 27 years, there's, there's this kind of pop culture mythology of some great artists who have died at the age of 27. So Jean-Michel Jean -Michel Basquiat is one of these artists. Amy Winehouse is one of these artists. Kurt Cobain is one of these artists. Jimi Hendrix is one of these artists who lived to only be 27 years old, which is not as long as we would have wanted to 
have them, you know, not as long as we would have wanted to be able to benefit from their artistry. And I connect it because of this idea of being discovered, right? So Hydromomalis gigas was discovered and then 27 years later, they were gone. And so these also are artists who struggled with what fame and celebrity mean in a capitalist context specifically. And, you know, fame and celebrity are generated by capitalism in, in, in order to, um, it's, it really is an economic model, right? So it's, it's not that everyone in the world needs to listen to, the, to, 10, <laughs> to 10 musicians. It could be every community had their own musicians and there's so much brilliance and it's, it's not scarce, it's completely abundant. But in order to finance something like the music industry that we have, for example, or even you know, the um, profound elitism of the, of the visual art industry that we still have, it, um, it takes something else, like a story about this mystique and, and a separation. And we can see over and over again, the experiences that people have had where um, it wasn't sustainable. They felt profoundly isolated. They, um, in some cases, in the cases of the people that I'm mentioning, engaged in self-harm and drug abuse. And there, there's, um, they weren't able to survive past 27 years. So I do think that, I do think that it's connected and when I think about, I don't know what it was like in Europe, you know, when fur coats became the craze and everybody was like, we gotta have a fur coat. And this is, this is how we show our wealth. And also we live in Europe and it's super cold. We wish we didn't live here, whatever it is, you know, like whatever it was at the time, but it just seems so frivolous when then you think about the existence of an entire species and and though these artists who only survived 27 years also were involved in a craze, right? Like there, there, there were people who were, grunge was a craze, you know, for when Kurt Cobain was alive and a, and a practicing artist. And um, even like quote unquote graffiti art became this craze and Basquiat was lifted up and separated in this particular way. And I do think that these forms of separation, which again are exactly what I'm pushing against in this book because we're not separate and we're not separate from marine mammals. We're not separate from the ocean is uh, laughs in the face of separation, right? It's just like not separate. That is, that's the direction that I think is what we need for what you all are, you know, have been talking about in your course about sustainability and about survival and about what does it look like to think about a long term when we when we can see the consequences of human actions on contemporary climate change? And then scientists. So, you know, I think that I have been surprised at how positive the reception of Undrowned has been from scientists and marine biologists, and like how many times I've been invited to speak to groups of scientists and. Um, there is an awesome organization called Black and Marine Science that I've gotten to collaborate with and they're awesome and amazing. And they, they made Undrown their book of the year and they all read it, you know, so that there's been some really wonderful response. I got to actually the last writing workshop that I facilitated before uh, quarantine started in, in 2020 was a workshop for scientists at Caltech to write about what they study differently, like more in this loving way, which was so, so, so fun. And yeah, so I, I have been really surprised, but then not surprised because I already was like, I suspect that you all are in love, you know? And, and many, many people have been like, you're right. You know, like I am doing this because of great feelings of love. So I'll say, I feel very supported by the scientific community and, I think it's also been liberating for, for some scientists too, to think about the fact that, well, what, what's the way that they really wanna tell their stories? What are the ways that they really wanna share what they're learning? And maybe it doesn't have to conform to these um, isolating, separating colonial forms every time in order to reach people. So yeah, thank you for both of those questions, Violaine and Samantha.
Thank you for that lovely answer, Dr. Gums. <laughs> um, okay, so we, I have another question from Professor Robles. Robles, sorry, Professor. Hey, Professor Robles. Um, oh, and another question. Okay, so first from Professor, um, the question is, can you expand on your notion of dub as intertextuality conversation and sound experimentation? Jamaican music legacy. For sure, for sure. So dub, dub, my book dub is called dub because it's written after Sylvia Winter. I, I'm just thinking about W, like the first letter of her last name. But of course, Sylvia Winter is a is a Jamaican theorist and and I'm also Jamaican. And so dub music, the legacy, okay, represent. <laughs> we I am too, Dr. Yes, yes. So um, that's part of the that's part of the connection and, and part of what's so important to me about so the way Sylvia Winter theorizes the Caribbean and invites us into it as a as a theoretical and political space. And part of what also has shaped the political language and movements of Jamaica is dub music. And a relationship to music that says we have we have a layered archive, right? So we have rhythms that we'll use and somebody will use it this way and then somebody else will, will use the same one but they're saying something different. Often they're actually critiquing what the other person said. And it's this whole conversation that can happen through sound and it happens in a, in a space where a collective embodied space right, where, where people are, are involved in these ongoing conversations. And then out of that, in Jamaica evolved dub poetry, which is a political call and response, poetic movement that um, is, yeah, has certainly very much influenced me um, personally as a poet, but also again, is this form that pushes against separation, right? Because in the dub poem, the poet created it and they're speaking it out loud, but they're speaking it in a way where you know where you come in and there's a call and response there and there's a participatory ethos to that. And so in diaspora, because as we just <laughs> demonstrated in this chat, Jamaicans all over the world, right? Um, we are in all places and dub, dub has become everything, right? DB Young, Anita Africa has created dub as a theater methodology and has an entire surplusy method of youth leadership and, and, and what it means to be a politically accountable artist. Okay, so all of that is to say dub means many, 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 many things. Of course, dub means um, in, the, in the film world, in the technology world, it also has to do with sound sound recording over in, in other languages. We know there's, there's all these different meanings for, for dub. For me, because I was engaging this idea that I mentioned earlier that Sylvia Winter emphasizes about how much it matters what story we tell and that we're actually living a narrative that we narrate and then believe in, or we could narrate something else and then believe in that and that actually becomes the materiality of our lives, I was and have been my whole, certainly my whole scholarly career pushed by Sylvia Winter to think about the, the narratives that I have, that I don't even re realize that I have, but they actually are organizing my life, what I think it means to be Jamaican, what I think it means to be Anguillian, what I think it means to be a person alive at this time, you know, all, all of those things. And because my book dub is an ancestral listening project, what I was doing was I was listening for what, what would my great grandfather have said? What, what do those Arawak ancestors have to say? The, the listening and the listening and the listening, and I'm listening over and over and over in that kind of rep repetitious cosmology that, that you see in, in dub as a political and artistic practice. So it, it made sense that it all, um, 
it all comes together. It is, as, as you say, Professor Robles, intertextuality, conversation, sound, experimentation. And it's, it's a particularly diasporic way for me to participate in that in, um, in another form. And so if, if you look at Dub, my book Dub, in relationship to anything else that I've written, you'll, you can understand it rhythmically, right? It's, it's, a, it's very much to me is a book of sound. And what I have noticed is when I hear other people read it out loud, it sounds, it sounds like what I heard, you know, which is not always the case. You know, it's like somebody might read it this way, somebody might read it this way, but actually the care of that particular text was me listening to it and saying it out loud over and over again until it was like, this is, this is the sound. And, you know, I couldn't stop until I was satisfied with that sound. And what that sound does is it invites your heartbeat into it. It, it allows you to know that this rhythm encompasses all of us, even though I might have been the person who put the particular words together. Okay, another magnificent answer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Xavier, and thank you for thanks for shouting out heavy swimmers. I I appreciate. Um... I, I watched that uh, maybe two days ago, and I, honestly, I got chills listening to it. Your delivery was perfect. The poem itself was amazing, amazing. Appreciate um, it. But right now, I would love to share with you a quote from the book and kind of explain to you like where my mind was when I read it. Um, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Or I have the text. Yeah. Everybody, go get your copy. Links in the chat. Links in the chat. Links in the chat. Okay. So this is page 67. It's the, the beginning of chapter seven, the be present section. And um, I'm not gonna necessarily read the quote, but this this section is about the, the Indus River dolphin. And you're talking about like the how they learned how to come back from extinction. And when I, when I read the Indus River Dolphin, I was like, Indus River Valley, isn't that one of the first like civilizations we learned about when we learned about like history in the world? And that brought me to indigeneity and the idea of that indigenous people, like even in the book, you talk about the, the Maori and the Taupupu and how that dolphin worked symbiotically with humans, with the indigenous people to, to warn them of storms and stuff. So I just wanted to get your take on like, indigeneity whether it's through the animals or the people and just how they understand the land and the water and how they just understand the world and we don't necessarily listen to them and as a result we do deal thing with things like the dust bowl in america because they were handled in the west pretty well before we showed up but i'll leave it to you yeah that, that's such a great question i think that the the connection that you draw to indigeneity is really very appropriate and it is I mean, this, this is what I think about over and over again when I think about climate and change and sustainability is all about relationship. It's, it's about relationship with place. It's about really honoring that we're not separate, right? And that the earth is not just like a, bag of goodies for us to extract while we're here <laughs> you know like that that's not that's not a sustainable relationship that is the extractive capitalist relationship that is currently dominant thanks to um, our species our so-called species with our so-called specialness which is actually not special so <laughs> i think that um that is why indigenous indigeneity as a relationship as a sacred relationship of belonging and connection, which is an, which is an inherently interspecies relationship is exactly what, what we have to remember. That's why I think indigenous leadership, when it comes to our policies, all of our steps, all of our new practices now is really, is really important. And and there, there's also an interspecies reality of indigeneity, right? There are plants, 
animals that are indigenous in particular places have been in relationship and adaptation with place for a long time. It's not something that's static, you know, because, you know, as I talk about, even with the Indus River dolphin, they have adapted over time. And all sorts of things have happened, like bandits at the, you know, like all sorts of things have happened in, in the lifetimes of the Indus River dolphin, just that dolphin. And of course, that's, that's only one example. And we also are in a process of adaptation. We also are in, are in processes of migration, right, that are, um, that cause us to adapt, that cause us to be in relationship with each other differently. And I just, I just want to affirm that the indigeneity as a relationship, which is different from indigeneity as an identity, um, which not to say that, that doesn't exist, but it's, it's more complicated as, as an identity or as a category of the human is, is what Sylvia Winter would say or genre of the human is, it's, it's, all, it's all coming back to relationship. And so part of what I realized between the process of writing dub and also in the process of writing undrowned is that the apprenticeship I'm talking about, like when I say I'm a marine mammal apprentice, it means that I am humbly trying to learn to be in relationship to my context in a way that emulates the expansiveness, grace, breathing, presence that I see marine mammals engaging. And so it's no coincidence that as I was writing this, I was always looking for those indigenous relationships. I was looking for pre-capitalist relationships, or I was looking for ongoing relationships of, of stewardship. Like those examples are very important to me in the book because, because right, what, what I've already stated, what I'm pushing against is a colonial relationship to, to all of life. And so we need that decolonial relationship, which honors the existing of an indigenous relationship, not just before, but right now. Um, thank you for that answer, Dr. Gums. And um, you guys, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to comment them in the chat. Um, I'm going to go back or, or raise your hand. Yeah, I'm going to go back to a question that the Giselle asked earlier about um, the, the metaphor you were trying to portray with dolphins and their connection like to humans, not just indigeneity. Yeah, well, there, so there's multiple ways, right, that that, that, that comes in. Um, one of the ways, I mean, I talk about my own grandmother as a dolphin listener and um, the reasons why my grandmother designed the revolutionary Anglian flag and the reason that it's three dolphins swimming in a circle has to do with um, that resonance, right, and, and that relationship the the relationship that I really ground us in in the preface and that I think leads to the title being undrowned is about the middle passage and it's it's also in a, in a literary lineage with Octavia Butler in Wild Seed writing about the dolphins swimming alongside the enslaving ships as they made the transatlantic journey. And so I think about those relationships earlier, you, you all brought up this connection between the fact that this is something I draw out in, in Undrowned that the enslaving ships and the whaling ships are in many cases, literally the actual same ships used for both of those purposes. And understanding that the pre-existing kinship a pre-existing mammalian kinship um, survived that. It survived that period of the Middle Passage and of the most intense whaling. And the most intense period of whaling was the same time period as the Middle Passage. It was the time where oil, so think about the, the way that like our societies depended on petroleum oil now, all of that was actually oil from marine mammals, blubber oil that was, um, taken from whales, literally every lamp 
that was in the United States at that time was lit by, by the death of whales. So, um, so I think about, I think about that connection in, in multiple ways. I think about what it means for the, those types of predatory relationships to be the preconditions for a whole society. Like that we don't have anything that we would call the history of the United States without the stolen labor, the stolen people, the murdered whales, you know, like we, it just doesn't exist without that. And so it's not surprising that the United States continues to reproduce that. And part of what helps that happen is that it's, it's unacknowledged, right? And, and we see that there's even this effort to not, not teach anything about slavery in the schools, you know, all, all of those things are, are connected. But then there's also this connection and what I see and imagine as a site of marine mammal apprenticeship with the survivors of the Middle Passage that has to do with what it is to be in, the, in a vibrational sound space, what it is to be listening, what it is to be underwater together and what it is to, to learn to breathe through your crown or to remember that this soft spot that we're all born with at the top of our heads and the blowholes that whales and dolphins use to breathe right now are actually, they actually come from the same source and they're, and they're part of our kinship and relationship. I could talk about that forever, but I'll, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, um, I'll pause there at least for now. I feel like I can listen to you talk about this forever. Um, I just want to say I really do appreciate the, these connections that you made with whales and dolphins to humans. I never thought of it in that way. Um, so I've been, my mind has been blown this whole semester learning these connections. Um, okay, so we have a question from Sydney who says, who's asking, I'm Dr. Gums, have you listened to Nat Geo's Into the Devs podcast with Tara Roberts? I have, I have, I haven't. Well, it's not finished, right? There's, and I don't think I'm, I don't think I've listened to the most recent episode, but I have listened to that podcast and I learned about it from a friend of mine who's interviewed on the podcast, Ayana Fluellen, who is an archaeologist. She's a Black feminist archaeologist and she is part of Divers, Divers with a Purpose, which is, which is what Dr. Ch I mean, Tara Roberts explorer Tara Roberts that's what they call you when you when you're a National Geographic official explorer Tara Roberts is a part of diving with a purpose and describes her her um, learning about that organization and getting trained to scuba dive and and all of this but I learned about it through Ayana Fluellen who um, it was deep because so I have a book called M archive after the end of the world and one of the scenes in that book, the book came out in 2018. And one of the scenes in that book talks about the black marine scientists, the depth scientists. And it was like a dream that I had. I was like, I see these black scuba divers, you know, like creating another science. And then my friend Ayana was like, so I'm getting trained to scuba dive so I can do archeology span about the slave ships. And I was like, girl, I think I just wrote about you. <laughs> like, you know, like it, it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, you know, this is, this is real. And, and that was, M Archive was one of those experiences where I wrote all of these scenes that I was like, this seems like it's in the far future and it's on another planet. And, and then it would be like, oh no, this is actually right here, right now. So um, all that is to say, I think it's, I, I'm super excited about that podcast. I'm super excited. There's an issue of National Geographic where um, diving with a purpose, there's like photos, there's a photo of my friend Diana in there. So yes, I listened to it. Um, and I recommend everybody else listen to it too. It's really, it's really, really great. So yeah, um, we were we read the book edited by um, Ayana Johnson. It's called All We Can Save. We read a couple passages from it early in the semester. Um, are there more questions? No. Do I have oh, thank you, Dr. Gums, for coming out. You did amazing. We loved your book. Um, your, your answers were really great. Yeah. Oh, thank you all so much for inviting me. Thank you everybody who, who came. Thank you for just allowing 
this longing that I have to be a part of your experience and a part of your lives and creating such a wonderful way to share it with the community. I really, I'm impressed. Y'all did great. I love the questions and I hope we get to keep in touch and have more conversations in the future. And uh, we are so happy that you came. Thank you so much, Dr. Gums. We know that um, time is, is elastic. It's also very precious. And so we appreciate you making time for us and to meet with us. And we thank everybody who came into our Zoom room with their questions and their ideas and their listenings. Um, and our class is all excited. They're here um, with their cameras off. We are about to go into uh, spring break and think about resting and breathing and maybe even having a laugh. Um, thank you so much um, to uh, the English department, to the Dean's office, Dean Jessica Lang she is here um, and to Beth Harpaz from the English department and Anthony Mira for helping us with our tech. And of course our fabulous hosts, Bernika Banks, Christy Thomas and Xavier Jones and everybody from the BLS Climate Justice and Racial Justice class. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, Dr. Gums. Thank you. Thank you. Our class, we say love a lot and I love y'all. Um, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, we will post the recording on our class blog. Um, so if anybody wants to follow along on our readings, or if you just want to hear this again, you can find it on our Climate Justice is Racial Justice class. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Love y'all too. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Dr. Gums. Thank you, Dr. Gums.